and to welcome you all here. First, a round of applause for um, Anna and Cactus, who've put a lot of work, and Jamie may around here too. They're awesome, so thank you. And we will have people filtering in. There is an annual tradition here at Colorado Law of having a spectrum conference. And the person responsible for this is Pierre de Vries, who you'll get to know today. He has put extraordinary thought and care into designing the topics. You are in for an intellectual feast and tour de force. It is no exaggeration to say that Pierre and the work he's been able to do here, um, Dale Hatfield and I have the privilege of working with him, have defined the frontiers of spectrum law and policy for a world where wireless connectivity is increasingly fundamental to how we live, work, play. This is a big deal for all of us. This has been so inside baseball spectrum regulation that most people uh, are not able to understand it or bring analytical rigor to it. One of the projects that Pierre has been involved in is turning that around. Most recently, he testified before the Senate Commerce Committee. And we had the fun scene of Corey Gardner, a graduate of this law school, coming in to thank Pierre for all the good work he was doing in Colorado Law. And we had the committee chairman, John Thune, trying to really take these concepts in and help set an intellectual agenda. Uh, that is a uh, work that remains um, in progress. It's work I'm really proud of. And without any further ado, let me turn over the program to Pierre. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. That's a, Phil always does such a very good warm-up. It's hard to follow. Welcome to Silicon Flatirons, everybody, um, to this conference on risk assessment in spectrum policy. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to Silicon Flatirons for those of you who don't know it. Uh, we have a threefold mission here. Uh, the first is to elevate the debate. Uh, the second is to support and enable entrepreneurship. And the third is to inspire and prepare and place students in tech policy and law. And in fact, this conference is about all three of those things. We're looking forward to uh, a spirited and a generous debate today uh, about these topics where we can all learn something and we can contribute to the common good. Um, the second part of the mission is about entrepreneurship. So this is about policy innovation, but it's also about policy innovation that will make the world safer entrepreneurs. And thirdly, the students who are here today, and we, they will come and go, they are very important, they're key to us here, not only because they ask the best questions, but be also because they're the ones who are actually going to take this work into the future. So let me just give you a quick motivation. Why are we having this conversation here today? Uh, everybody wants more radio. Everybody wants more radio services, and that means that the services uh, and the f radio use of spectrum is being squeezed more and more as we go forward. And so as you squeeze all these services more tightly together, the risk of interference increases. Um, now, a bit of interference is OK, but too much is bad, because and you suffer harm if you're the incumbent service. And the question for the spectrum regulator becomes, if you have an incumbent service and there is a new entrant, should you allow the new entrant? That trade-off is becoming more and more difficult. And that trade-off between the potential benefits of a new service and the risk of harm to the incumbent, that trade-off has traditionally been informed by engineering analysis, but it's been an analysis that's typically been a worst-case analysis. In other words, you do your sums by picking a single value for all the parameters that affect the outcome, and typically you pick an extreme value for those. That has limitations as a method. Uh, if you select just one value out of the possible universe of values, uh, you're not going to reflect reality very well, then it may well be that you're going to ignore some failure modes that in fact turn out to be the ones that matter and that, that weren't the ones that you thought of to begin with. It also tends to be conservative as a method. It easily leads to rules that provide not only the protection that the incumbent needs, but more protection than they need, and at the same time not allowing the new services that give value that all of us would like. Now this actually does make sense as an approach where there isn't a lot of pressure on spectrum operating rights. Um, and it is tenable when there isn't a great deal of demand. My sense is it's becoming less and less tenable, which is why we're having this conversation here today and why we're having similar conversations in DC. 
It turns out that there is an alternative to worst case analysis. It goes by many names, quantitative risk assessment, probabilistic risk assessment, risk informed regulation. And it's been used by just about every other industry for decades. And that's why we have some of the leading figures uh, in other industries and in other regulatory contexts to talk to us today that we can learn from them. How have they done it in those other areas? And how can we do that in spectrum? So the goal for this conference is twofold. One is to learn these lessons. What do people in other industries have to teach regulators like the FCC and the NTIA? What are the best practices? What are the pitfalls? What are the opportunities and what are the obstacles? With that as a background then, the goal for each of the sessions, but particularly the last one, is to map out how this approach can be used in spectrum policy. What do we do and where do we start? So to just outline the agenda that you can see in your program, uh, we're going to have three panel sessions. And we're going to start with a broad view and we're going to funnel down. So the first session is going to look at uh, quantitative risk assessment uh, as a technique, uh, give a bit of history, give a bit of definition, um, talk about where it's been used in the private sector and the public sector, how it's been used to assess harm, how it's been used to find opportunities, and to provide different perspectives, an engineering perspective, economic perspective, and perhaps a psychology of risk perspective. The second session is going to add more specificity, begin to talk more and more about the use of these techniques in regulation. Talk about the history of risk-based regulation. What are the stages of adoption in a particular industry? And what are the lessons that we can learn when we apply this to spectrum? And then that's going to be the focus of the last session where the, the panelists will be talking about the changing context of spectrum policy and how we can use these techniques. Now that's the plan. Um, with apologies to uh, Field Marshal von Molke, um, no plan for a conference survives contact with what the speakers decide to say on the day. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, overlaps between the panels, there are going to be overlaps, there are going to be tangents, they're all welcome because we want to have a debate and not, not miss something important. And you'll also see that we've mixed in people with spectrum expertise and people with risk assessment expertise, and in fact some people have both in the same body. Um, to help us think about how these things overlap. Just a couple of ground rules for what we're going to do today. You know, the first uh, mission for Flatirons is to elevate the debate. So we're trying to find an answer. We're not trying to win an argument. But more importantly, um, I would uh, encourage the NTR. Um, the NTR is the no TLA rule. Uh, and a TLA is a three-letter acronym. So what I just did was to break my rule. No jargon, please, no acronyms, because people won't know what you are saying, just as you didn't know. Um, the second is that um, students are important, uh, as I said, in our mission. So we will be um, applying the wiser rule. Uh, so the moderators will actually call on the students first uh, at the, when we move to Q&A, give them the first opportunity. Uh, and there will probably be faculty who can call on students if there aren't volunteers. And I think the other thing is to, to call on students to interact with the practitioners that are here uh, and the practitioners to talk to the students. We've got a reception afterwards. Uh, the only price of admission is a willingness to have those kinds of conversation. So let me just close. Thank you very much. Thank you to Phil Weiser for creating and building Silicon Flatirons without which this conversation wouldn't be happening, without which I wouldn't be here. Thank you to the Law School for hosting the event. Uh, thank you to um, our sponsors who are listed on the back of your program, without whom it, this would also not have been possible. Um, Phil has already thanked Anna uh, and Cactus and Jamie and the team of students for their work. I'd like to thank them again. Um, and I'd like to thank the speakers and the moderators and the panelists for being here today. They're all very busy people. And we're very grateful for the time they've put into prepping. I know they've put in a lot of time and for being here today. And also thank you to you for being here, uh, whether you're here in person or on the web, whether you're watching in real time or watching the file. Thank you very much for joining us. So we're going to move into um, the first session right now. The first session is about risk analysis in engineering and public policy. There are exhaustive bios in the program, so I'll just say a few words about our keynote speaker, 
and the moderator. Uh, our keynote speaker is Professor Paul Fishbeck. Uh, he's a professor in the Engineering and Public Policy Department at CMU uh, and the director of the Center for the Study of the Study and Improvement of Regulation. Um, he's done work in so many areas re related to risk. You'll hear about some of them today. Some of the things I think he probably won't be talking about include you know, looking at mining, looking at um, insurance buying behavior, looking at paint strippers, looking at health and environmental issues in very local areas. The moderator for this session will be uh, Tom Power, who's the Senior Vice President and General Counsel at the CTIA. He's actually given 25 years of service uh, in uh, the spectrum area in, in, in private practice. Um, he's been at the White House, he's been at the NTIA, um, and in fact, he served at the FCC as well. So without further ado, let me call on uh, Paul to uh, do his presentation for us, and then we'll ask the panelists to come up and have the conversation. Do you need a microphone? Yeah, why not? Yeah, paint strippers is not what you think it is. So. <laughs> Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, I teach at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, uh, for my new class, I always wear a bike helmet all day long. Why? It greatly reduces my chance of dying. <laughs> it has a huge impact. Every morning I wake up and I have to decide how to get to school. I could walk, but if I walk, I could die. I could bike. If I bike, I could die. Well, I could drive. If I drive, I could die. So I don't leave the house. I mean, if you think about it, worst case analysis doesn't inform decision making, right? It has very little to do. Am I okay? Uh, can you hear me or not? Yeah, let me turn, I'll turn this on. We're recording, right, right, right. That's good. All those, I'll repeat my opening remarks. But if you think about it, worst case analysis is, a, you know, is not that useful for decision making. You have to make decisions all the time. And guess what? Risk is inherent in everything that you do, right? I often ask my students, tell me something you know for sure. And if you start thinking about it, it gets to be a little tricky. I actually have a test where I allow the students to get minus infinity. If they put a zero probability that a multiple choice is correct, that means that there is no way that can be correct. And if it happens to be correct, they get minus infinity. It's hard to pull that up. But if you think about it, right, so probability, uncertainty, risk permeates everything that we do. How the heck do we think about it? So a classic way is you just look at probability times consequence. And that's sort of the, the, you know, what's used all the time. But from an engineering perspective, where we want to solve problems, and we want to reduce risk, this definition is not sufficient. And then it was mentioned earlier that there was this, this seminal paper, the very first paper in the Journal of Risk Analysis was done by Kaplan and, and Garrick, and they defined risk as a triplet, okay? A scenario, what can happen, right? And then how likely is it could ha that it could happen? And then if it does happen, what are the consequences? Now, with this breaking it apart into three steps, now we can start thinking about what can we do to impact the risk, right? So we could go through and change the probability of that initiating event. Or we could change the damage that is done given the initiating event. Those are two very separate things that you cannot see if you have the more simplistic expected value calculation. And then once again, risks include not only costs, but also benefits. There's the risk of having a good outcome and how you, you know, put these things together. And then once again, uncertainty and risk permeates nature, mechanical systems, and then human and societal events. Starting to include humans, life gets very exciting. Okay, so, I, you know, I, I was trying to decide which way to do this, but I'm gonna start with some negative things things that didn't quite work out. So we can reduce the likelihood of the initiating event, that sequence of stuff, or we could eliminate, or and or, we could eliminate the consequences. So, you know, we're, we're steaming along and there are icebergs out there. Maybe it might be good to have our lookout with a pair of binoculars, right? The Titanic didn't. Uh, 
And then we could have these watertight doors so in case there is a problem, you know, we can do something about it, right? So here they were, there's the water line in red, and they thought about, gee, we could lose some, uh, you know, some holes in the bottom, but we're going to have these watertight doors that go above the water line. We're guaranteed. We've removed all risk. What happened? Okay. Well, the, the nose tipped over, the water filled up, went above the watertight doors, went over the top, and then it just started the sequence going down. Right? They had doors. They had automatic sensors built in to stop the problem. Right? The reason why they didn't carry the watertight doors higher was because people were on the boat, and they didn't want to have people walking through watertight doors on the way to the ballroom. Right? So they did a calculation. They thought about all these things, but they didn't follow it all the way through. Right? Build a seawall around your nuclear power plant. Of course you will. Right? There's Fukushima, right? Uh, there are six reactors there. This is the tidal wave. It's coming up onto the, it's amazing. It's an amazing photograph. They actually captured the tsunami coming in. Okay? And what happened, tsunami's fine. We can get the water, things get wet. But they had their backup emergency diesel generators in the basement. And then the basement fills up with water. They lost all their generators. They couldn't cool the reactors anymore. If it hadn't been for that, if they'd been anywhere else, it would have been fine. It would have been, a, well, it wouldn't have been fine, but it wouldn't have been a disaster. All right, so this is also this big debate between prescriptive and performance-based standards, regulation. If you look in here, uh, you know, there are sprinklers. There are sprinklers. You can see them spaced evenly and so on. There's a, there's a fire code that says, in a room this size with this many people, you must have these fire sprinklers established this far apart with this pressure and so on, right? But has anyone calculated the probability of you being able to get out of the, out of the room given a fire of a certain size and nature? No, they haven't. They just said, if you do this, we'll declare it to be safe, right? Is that a good idea or not? Then there's the other side, which is performance-based. I don't care where you put the sprinklers, but allow at least five minutes for people to get out. How do you start to rectify between the things? The standard, the prescriptive standard, is trivial to do. I put the sprinklers in, I check my boxes, I put my fire doors, I'm all done. I don't have to think about it. I just do it. The performance-based standard, it's much, much, much more complicated. So here we did a simulation of fire in an apartment. And we looked at where the fire could start. And across the bottom, we have how many seconds you have until you cannot get out. I mean, you're, you're, the, the conditions are so bad, you can't get out. How hot can the human body take? Can you take 100 degrees C, 200 degrees Fahrenheit? Is that going to be incapacitating? No. You can still get out. It's amazing what people can do. But not if you're an elderly person in a walker. And then you've got real problems. But how do you account for that in the regulation? Lots of uncertainty. Lots and lots and lots of uncertainty. Uh, I did a big study looking at oil tankers, Exxon Valdez, full speed into an island that was five miles off course. Nobody thought that that was going to happen. There's, there's no way to be five miles off course going full speed into an island. And so no one designed anything to account for that. It didn't, that can't happen. But there was a sequence of events that led to that. Right? And so. Big debate. What do we do? They passed a regular new law saying all oil tankers must be double hulled. That's it. By 2015, everything double hulled or equivalently safe. What the heck does that mean? What does equivalently safe mean? Okay, so is that the probability of a leak given a certain accident scenario? Is it the amount of oil given a leak? Is it the worst damage that's done? Is it the impact on the environment? You know, all these questions were left unspecified. And there was a big debate. There were proposals of designs that were put forward and went to the International Maritime Organization for a vote. 71 countries were there, and they voted whether the design was equivalently safe or not. And it was a couple of designs were 70 to 1. And we, the United States, said, no, that's not equivalently safe. Because we focused only on one metric. We focused only on the probability of spill. So there were other designs that would leak more often, but never leaked a lot. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? So the design of the metric is really important. 
uh, and then this is, you know, we simulated, we talk about Monte Carlo simulation. We're taking oil and dumping it into the water off of Houston or outside of uh, the Delaware River up in New Jersey, and we're putting on weather events and we're seeing where it goes and how much oil gets deposited, and we're trying to develop metrics to figure out the damage of different, different types of spills and different designs. Okay? So, things you can do, right? You've got to acknowledge that there's uncertainty here. And maybe you can bound it. Maybe there's some way you can do, you know, something you can do. Given, you know, you know, we don't know what's happening, but, you know, how safe is safe enough? How much interference is permissible or allowable? Well, it might depend on who's being interfered with. Okay? You know, we want to be sure, but, you know, what, what can we do? So there's, you know, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be talks today about, you know, in the medical field, how do we go about taking, you know, figuring out how dangerous chemicals or new procedures are or new medicines are, right? I mean, you do studies on rats, and then you've got to sort of say, given that, how do I extrapolate that to a human? And very interesting studies and safety factors and various other very deep, more and more detailed models coming into play, okay? Uh, nuclear power plants, right? We, this came up in, the, in the, the lunch discussion, but this is where this probabilistic risk is, uh, analysis started. Detailed studies of all the accident scenarios that could happen. Well, this pump could fail, then this pipe could burst, and then this could happen, and then the diesel generator doesn't turn on. And, and you look at all of the fault trees and all the thousands and thousands of scenarios that could happen. And they discovered all kinds of things without even you know, determining probability they went through and they found, gee, these sequences, you know, if these combinations of things happen, this is really bad, so let's just fix that problem. Maybe it's easy to fix. Or there's, you know, one thing that affects multiple different systems on the, in the plant. And then we can also figure out the likelihood, but we can also go through and we can use this information to make safer and better plants. We know a lot more about what's going on now than we did before. Right? No magic bullet, though, and, and then the, the NRC is still working on this. They have not, you know, said, okay, we've solved this problem, let's stop. This is, you know, a couple of years ago, they're going through, we've got to figure out how we do this risk, they have a risk management task force that's thinking hard about this. Right, so, the problem I'm working on right now is you have a, re, you have a power plant, and there's got to be a zone around it where, with inside that distance, you have special procedures in case there's an accident. So you've got to be able to provide the people who live there with pills so that they don't get thyroid cancer. Or you have to have enough fire trucks and so on. So there's a, in, in 1975, they did a study, what I will say is a flawed study, but they, based on that study, they said 10 miles is the size of the zone. Every plant, 10 miles, inside that you have to go through and take care of these special, special needs and special things. They now have new designs that are much smaller and much safer. Do we still need to use that 10-mile zone? Maybe we can do something smaller, right? And so, you know, this is things that are being talked about and, you know, I'm working on right now. So we could always default to the 10-mile. Maybe we could go and do, given this particular design and reactor and location, we could do a worst-case distance, right? It may be longer than the 10 miles. And that would scare the heck out of the NRC. Uh, but then we can do a scalable. Maybe we can do a risk analysis and find out what the likelihood of various you know, radioactive material deposition is for areas around the plant. And this is where we would use that PRA, that risk study, to go through. And we want to be sure that, you know, we want to be 95% sure that, sure that no one outside of the zone gets more than one rim. Or do you want to be 99% sure? or 99.99% sure, and this is what they're asking us right now. All right, so here we know, as you get further away, and then you have dose over there, the uncertainty to get further away, the dose gets, you know, the spread of the distribution gets bigger, you know, and where do you draw the limit as to what's going on? And what if it's greater than 10 miles, which is the default for all the big reactors that are out there? That's gonna really shake up the industry, all right? And we have uncertainties about uncertainties, now what do we do? Uh, so here, you know, then you look at interventions to reduce risk, right? And these are various regulations that have been put out. And if you do the, count, the costs and the benefits, and you look at sort of dollars that are being invested to save a human life, my gosh, it goes from 100,000 to, what is that, 100 billion down at the bottom, depending on the regulation. That's the value of a life saved, right? 
tremendous variety of stuff, right? And some of them, of course, don't work. You know, you put fire retardant chemicals on your kids' jammies, and it causes cancer, which is another sort of don't hate when that happens. Okay, quick spectrum, sort of just a very simple example about how this could be maybe used. Okay, so here we have, you know, do we allow uh, allow sharing, you know, spectrum sharing for a certain application, a certain region, right? And we either allow it or we block it, and then the question is, is there going to be interference or not? So those are two things that are, we have a decision to make about blocking or, or not, and we have, a, we have an outcome, which is interference or not. And so of the four boxes there, which would be the best outcome? And I suspect that it's to allow sharing if there is no interference. That would be great. Greater use and all that sort of stuff. The worst would be to allow sharing and then have bad interference. That would be bad. The other two guys are sort of a little bit, a little harder to define, but if you block sharing and there would have been no interference, what you've done is you've pushed the use of that, you know, of these people who would have used that shared space, and now, you know, it's less optimal for them, and there's a cost associated with that. But likewise, if you block and there would have been interference, that's, you know, that's good. That's not bad. So you look at how these things sort of filter in, and what you can do is you can sort of figure out what the threshold for interference is. The probability of interference can be determined by knowing those four values. The ratio of those values determines the probability of interference. So maybe you can't go through and do the calculation, but you have some general idea where it is. This kind of analysis allows you to focus in on where it's important to know the likelihood of interference. So we have, you know, we have to go through and we have to sort of, we don't have to quantify what each one is, what we need to know is how much bigger they are from each other. So you have to know the allow use, given no interference, how much better is allowing use than blocking use, relatively speaking. How big is that gap? And then likewise, for the interference column, you know, how much worse is allowing use than blocking use? Okay? And using those, just the distance between them, you can go through and you can do a very simple analysis. So across the bottom, we have the probability of interference, so on the far left, there's no interference. And you can look at the distance between the improved service and the lost opportunity. Then on the right side is where you definitely have interference. That's bad, right? And then you have the avoided problem, and then you have the real problem at the bottom. You have these two differences between those outcomes. And I don't care where they are, right? You can move them up and down relative to each side of the, but the intersection will not change. That intersection, which determines the threshold by which you want to determine whether or not to, to allow blocking or not. So in this particular case, if the interference is very low, if you're pretty sure it's going to be close to zero, then you want to go through and allow use. But if it's anywhere from you know, moderate to high, you're going to say no. Okay? But if you have a different sort of size of those things, you can push it the other way. Okay? And then you can also go through and have a case where you know, the upside is, the difference is really minimal, but the downside is huge, and then this becomes maybe like the light squared problem, right, where, you know, no, we're not going to do that, because, you know, the, the, the probability of interference would have to be, you know, any probability of interference would, in fact, make this not a worthwhile thing to do. So, conclusions, it's out there. You, you're, you're, you're doing something with it, you know, you, you know it's there, you can't go and rely just on worst case analysis. It, do, it just clouds the, and does not provide a way to understand and reduce risk. All right? Other people are doing it, it's, it's around. It hasn't been solved, but it's around and it's being used. All right? So when you start looking at societal risk or individual risk, there's risk aversion. You don't like risk. Now, what is, you know, what's a, what's a, what's a rational risk aversion for a society? All right? And then, Always think about who pays, who benefits, you know, how they get paid, how they get, when does it happen? Are the risks delayed? Are they immediate? Is it future generations? And then think about there are going to be winners and losers, and, and there can be bad luck can happen too. You know, you based it on your best judgment, didn't work. How are you compensating the people who lose? All right? That interference that's totally unexpected, right? How do we, in fact, go and compensate for that? And then Poorly done risk analysis is not good. 
right? That'd be bad. Uh, and, and so, you know, you really don't want to just do a, a risk analysis. You want to do a good risk analysis, right? Think about what could go wrong. It's those darn unintended consequences that bite you in the butt, and they do continuously. So you've got to be able to, you know, understand. Thank you. Who's next? Okay, so this, um, this autonomous has just come up. All right. Uh, thank you, Paul. It was great. Uh, as uh, Pierre said, I'm Tom Power. I'm the uh, senior VP and general counsel at CTIA, which is uh, the Wireless Trade Association in Washington, D.C. CTIA used to stand, some, stand for something, and uh, now it's just a collection of letters. Um, but that's who we are. Um, it stands for lots of things in an advocacy way, but uh, otherwise <laughs> it's just a collection of letters. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the panel real quickly. Uh, I'm going to let them uh, follow up with a little introduction of their own because I think uh, uh, they, uh, particularly in Francisco's uh, case, is they're real practitioners of uh, quantitative risk uh, assessment. Uh, and so I think as they start to describe their work, uh, you'll uh, we'll dig into the substance at the same time. But just uh, real briefly, uh, Francisco Zagmut is a managing partner at Epics Analytics. As I said, he's a real pr practitioner in this area. I'll. Uh, I'll let him dig into that, but I'll just give you the background. He's got a PhD from Colorado State, a master's from UC Davis, and a DVM from the University of Chile, which makes you a veterinarian. That's right. <laughs> and I think probably the only one in the room. I'm just guessing. Probably. We got another one? <laughs> um, uh, next to Francisco, the spectrum nerds in the room uh, will recognize Greg Rostin. <laughs> Uh, Greg, uh, uh, 20 years ago, was part of the team at the FCC that designed and implemented the very first Spectrum Auctions. Uh, uh, he's now teaching economics at Stanford. He's the deputy director and senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and director of the public policy program at Stanford. And next to him is Bill Boyd. Bill is a law professor here at uh, the university. Uh, he has his JD from Stanford, his PhD from Berkeley. He clerked on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He was a Congressional Hill staffer. He worked at Cummington and Burling. Um, he's an impressive guy. I mean, these guys are too. But, um, um, and uh, I, I just want to start. I would normally start by saying thank you, Pierre, for having me here. And I did thank him at first um, because he said, could you come moderate a Spectrum conference you know, on a beautiful Friday? We just knew it would be uh, in Boulder. And, and you know, of course, uh, with the great minds we get out of here and great students. Uh, and then I, as I dug into it, I learned I had to uh, talk about quantitative risk assessment, which uh, uh, I've learned a lot about in the last few months. Uh, I didn't know so much about at the beginning. I am reminded of uh, when I got out of law school and I took the bar review course, and the professor teaching the course said, you know, there are three levels of knowledge in, in, in any field of endeavor. The first level, you're completely overwhelmed. You have no idea what you're talking about. The second level, you're getting a little comfortable. You can sort of talk a good game. The third level is, Oh my God, this is really hard. Um, Spectrum, I'm level two. I can glibly, you know, talk a good game. A quantitative risk assessment, I'm still at, at one. So that's my caveat, and I'm hoping that my panel uh, mates will here uh, save the day for us. Uh, so uh, why don't I turn first to you, Francisco? Tell us uh, a bit about your work at Epix uh, and how QRA fits into what you do. Sounds good. Thanks. I guess um, first, thank you, Tom, for for chairing this panel and also Pierre for arranging this and all the panel members. So Epics Analytics happens to be a consultancy on risk analysis based out of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we came across, I guess came, Pierre came across us while looking for different quantity methodology, which is in fact what we specialize on. Uh, we're kind of a 
interesting company. We, in fact, my, my business partner is sitting there, Dr. Hugo Grindel. Uh, I'm, in fact, a veterinarian, as you pointed out. <laughs> Although I don't think I can say I could ever heal your dog or any kind of animal because I haven't practiced as a veterinarian in a long time. So what we do in my company, we are a gener generic risk analysis company. So we work in all sorts of fields, a bit like what Paul was mentioning before. We go all the way from, let's say, the health part of, of risk analysis, which is probably where the foundations of risk analysis came together with nuclear energy. But also we work quite a bit in actuarial work, finance, and all sorts of things that need to, that require the measure, measuring and quantifying risk. I think that's as far as I can say for Epic. In terms of myself, uh, we have a team that's composed of very var a variety of different professionals, from again the vets to other type of people like uh, mathematicians, software programmers, um, and so on. So it's a very open discipline. It's not quite like going to law school where you become a lawyer and you work in law in different areas. Uh, risk analysts tend to come from many different areas of knowledge. I'm going to come back and, and have you dig into some of your uh, individual uh, cases where you've done this, but I'll, I'll move on first to uh, Greg. Um, Greg, I, I, I don't know whether QRA is a big part of your uh, uh, work at this time, but uh, I, just from the economic perspective, I'd be interested in your take on Paul's presentation. So, uh, yeah, so I, so I teach public policy. I teach a course at Stanford called uh, economic policy analysis, which has a huge focus on cost-benefit analysis, which is a, a very close cousin to QRA. And I, you know, I wish I could start out my class. I'm thinking about wearing a helmet to my class when I first do it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Or maybe either that or Skyping into the first class saying I couldn't leave my house, one of the two. <laughs> I don't know, but I definitely can learn on the teaching end and this as well as the substantive end. What, what I, uh, in this close cousin, I think I teach this every year to my students, and the lesson I want them to do is that this is really, really important, and it's really, really hard to do correctly. That getting, uh, getting you know, thinking in and digging in and doing, doing, trying to assess these probabilities and what are, the ga what are the magnitudes of the benefits and costs before you to, to try and do that is really hard. But it's important to do because otherwise we're just making up stuff. So we should try and at least minimize the amount of stuff we're trying to make up and trying to quantify what we can to see what kinds of trade-offs you're doing. That companies and governments do QRA all the time. They probably don't do it as much as they should, but they, they kind of try to assess these things. Uh, what are the probabilities of bad outcomes coming in? You, know, you guys are all probably familiar with Ford Pintos. And Ford actually made a calculation about whether they should change things or not trying to figure out what, what it was. You might want to give a little background, because I bet there are people here who aren't so, familiar. So Ford, Ford, Ford uh, made the Pinto. Not only was it a really, really ugly car, but it was a very useful and. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I won one in a raffle, by the way, <laughs> 72. So. Se second prize was two of them. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a very functional, low cost car, and, and, and very, very popular in the early 1970s in I guess sales exploded at one point. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> if you, that was how you, I remember a comedian saying that the way he stayed awake was he, driving was he would tailgate Pintos. So he, <laughs> make sure he paid attention. But they, if you rear-ended a Pinto, there were several instances where the car exploded, the, the gas tank exploded. And they kind of knew this might have been a problem. They did an internal study and had said, well, you know, it cost us a lot of money to re-engineer it. And we don't think there are going to be a lot of uh, problems. You know, this is something trying to assess what this risk would be is pr similar. You could say maybe the designers of Fukushima might have thought, hey, you know, if, if we move these generators out of the basement, it's going to cost us a lot of money. What's the chances of a tsunami coming in? It's really, really, really low. Well, that's why I say it's hard to do, but these getting these numbers right and these probabilities right are really important inputs into this. So that's, that was uh, kind of what I what I want, as, as Donald Rumsfeld said, you know, there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. He was made fun of, but I think this is a great statement for people to think about is, what should you worry about? You should worry about a lot of these known unknowns and even the unknown unknowns. How, you know, we don't know what the probability of a tsunami is, but we should think about it and worry about it and think, 
you know, well, we got to try and figure out something to understand what the risk is and what you're trying to put it into this framework. So that's uh, uh, kind of, I'll just stop there and we can keep going. I'm sure I could go on for a long time because I'm a professor, but I will stop. <laughs> Bill, I'm going to come right back to you, but Paul, I just have to ask you, on that Fukushima thing, was there ever any analysis that, do we know why they put the generators in the, was, the, was there any history on that? Did, yeah, I mean, it, well, it was a cost thing because, I mean, it's, you know, if you put them on the roof, that's a much more expensive, much harder maintenance problem as well. So there, there were sort of reasons to put them down low. <coughs> but, yeah, they didn't justify it. Uh, Bill, uh, why don't you talk about some of your background and how uh, risk assessment has factored in? So <clears throat> I think I'm here primarily because I've been engaged in an ongoing project on the history of formal approaches to risk in health, safety, and environmental law. Um, that comes out of longstanding interest and, and practice in the area. Um, I don't know anything about Spectrum. I'm at level zero. I, I thought that Spectrum was a vitamin supplement for middle-aged men. Uh, <laughs> this afternoon. I, I take that, by the way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I, I thought that's why I was here, right? It's just, there were problems with the vitamin pills. Um, but I uh, really appreciate being here and, and just hearing Paul talk and talking to Pierre a bit. And Pierre, by the way, is just a fantastic addition to the law school. He showed up at my door a few years ago and he had that sort of elven gleam in his eye and we had a two or three hour conversation and have continued to have these conversations ever since. But I do see some interesting parallels and lessons um, perhaps from the risk assessment, sort of the history of risk assessment in, in environmental law and, and health and safety law as well. And I think there are kind of two separate domains here that we should keep in mind, sort of going back to Paul's uh, really wonderful uh, opening discussion, risk assessment in the context of technology assessment and reactor safety and all of that has sort of been on a parallel track to risk assessment in the context of chemicals and carcinogens. And there's some overlap and cross-fertilization, but they have sort of proceeded in separate uh, parallel tracks to some extent. I, I want to spend some time talking about maybe some of the lessons in the history of that sort of risk assessment enterprise in the, in the health, safety, and environmental area. Well, why don't we just uh, go ahead, why don't you elaborate on that, because I think what we want to do, and as Pierre said, this panel is to really kind of educate the spectrum folks about uh, QRA more than the other way around. The later panels are going to, that equation is going to flip a bit, uh, but I think here we're trying to really learn more about what quantitative risk assessment is so that the, the folks who've been studying spectrum can really start thinking about how the commission, the FCC, would start adopting that. So I think getting into some individual case studies of where it's worked or where it hasn't worked and why uh, would be great. Sure, you want me to go? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think kind of the key topics or issues we should think about when we look at the experience and the history of this in environmental law are standards, burdens, who has the burden of performing the risk assessment, the analytical techniques and the changing conceptions and understandings of harm that emerge from changing analytical techniques, I'll come back to that, and then questions about institutional design. Uh, which includes the federal courts in a very important way. I think you cannot ignore the role of the federal courts in all of this. So let me just say a couple things about risk assessment in the context of commercial chemicals. And we can divide the world of commercial chemicals into industrial chemicals and say, let's call it pesticides, agricultural chemicals, okay? And you can include food additives here as well. So pesticides and food additives uh, are regulated under my favorite environmental statute. Well, pesticides are the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, so I'm avoiding the acronym uh, here, FIFRA, um, and to some extent under the Food Quality Protection Act. I'll come back to that in a minute. The general standard here, though, is unreasonable risk, and a pesticide will not be registered uh, and could be canceled if it poses an unreasonable risk. And we're essentially treating pesticides like technologies. We allow them into the world if we are uh, sure enough that, or, or, or satisfied that they're not posing an unreasonable risk. It's a little different for possible carcinogens, though, and the standard there for years and years was different, and it was a sort of worst case standard. It was a zero risk or zero tolerance approach that came out of the 1958 Delaney Clause or Delaney Amendment that basically said if the food additive, and we're including pesticide residues in this, has been shown to cause cancer in animals or humans, it's prohibited, full stop. That's a very simple way to proceed. Doesn't have a lot of analytical burdens attached to it. There's no real requirement that you do a risk assessment if 
we are killing animals with this particular chemical. It's not allowed into the food supply. Now, at the time, and this is really important in thinking about this, at the time, there were four known human carcinogens, and they were very potent, okay? 20 years later, in 1978, there are 37 known human carcinogens and 500-plus animal carcinogens. And suddenly, the world of Delaney in those sort of intervening sort of decades becomes untenable. And EPA and FDA are trying to figure out a way around Delaney, and they're figuring out various workarounds, and are developing quantitative risk assessment to try to deal with some of the challenges coming up with this Delaney prohibition. And ultimately, Congress has to step in in 1996 with the Food Quality Protection Act and creates a new standard, the Reasonable Certainty of No Harm standard, uh, that applies to sort of pesticide residues that are potentially carcinogenic. That creates more of an analytical burden, but some people, many people think that's a better standard. The key here, though, with pesticides is that since 1954, the burden has been on the manufacturers to demonstrate safety. And so EPA has various mechanisms to force additional testing and uh, data call-ins and things like that. But the, the burden has really been on the manufacturers. You need to show up with the information that we're requiring before you can sell your chemical and get it licensed, okay? With industrial chemicals, it's just the opposite. So these are chemicals like common solvents, formaldehyde, toluene, TC. There's a bunch of them, thousands, tens of thousands, right? There's 60, 70,000 of these chemicals in commerce. And these are regulated under a 1976 statute, the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA. The general standard, again, is unreasonable risk, but the burden is on EPA here, right, to show unreasonable risk before regulating. And they, the statute divides the world into new chemicals and old chemicals. You're an old chemical if you were in commerce before or when the statute is enacted and you're essentially grandfathered in and presumed to be safe, even though we had very little basic health and safety information on most of these chemicals. And for new chemicals, you have to provide notice to EPA. They then, if they find some unreasonable risk, can go forward and require you to do some additional testing. The real problem, though, is old chemicals. And EPA thought that they were going to go forward and make asbestos a test case here for how to regulate old chemicals under the statute. And they got slapped down by the Fifth Circuit in 1991 and essentially backed away and have not used their authority under the statute to regulate existing uh, chemicals. The point here is the burden matters a lot. And with EPA, since that 1991 decision, they've done one risk assessment under TSCA for trichloroethylene. It was just issued in June of 2014, 28 years after it was initiated. Okay, And so if you look at the history of risk assessment in industrial chemicals and what EPA has been doing for some of these blockbuster chemicals, formaldehyde, TCE, and others, there are a lot of other risk assessments going on that are important that are happening okay, but in these big cases, right, it's taken decades. And that's a cautionary lesson, it seems to me, that's worth coming back to. But I, I could go on and on. I'll, I'll, I'll just say two more things and then stop, and then we'll try to come back to some other. Standards do matter. So whether it's acceptable risk or unreasonable risk or reasonable certainty of no harm, there are a whole bunch of different variations of that. We could have more protective standards, too. Adequate margin of safety, ample margin of safety. The Clean Air Act has some of that as well. But I think burdens matter a lot more than standards. And one of the things we've seen, interestingly, in industrial chemicals in Europe, they've moved to a new model. They have um, a new program, well, it's about a decade old now, Registration, Evaluation, and Authorization of Chemicals, or REACH, right, which says no data, no market. You want access to the market, old chemicals, new chemicals, we don't care. You want access to the market, you want to sell your chemicals in the European Union, you have to show up with a basic dossier of health and safety information. And we will define what that is and try to help you streamline the process, but no data, no market. And I think it's important to think about this in the context of moving into spectrum, who has the burden and how that's going to be streamlined so that you don't end up with multi-decade risk assessments going on, things like that. Can I, can I yeah, ask a question about that, about the burden? Because it seems to me like it really depends on what you think the harm might be. If you thought that this was, you know, that, that chemicals might kill people or chemicals might cause somebody to scratch themselves a couple of times, you'd want to have a different question of who might have the burden and where the burden should lie. So you're suggesting the regulator has the burden on the scratching and... I, I, and I don't, I know, I don't, I just yeah. think that the, what, the, what the actual harm might be depends on where the burden should fall. I, I, I don't know if you... So it's hard to know kind of what the harm's going to be until somebody generates the information. Right. Yeah. So, I, but, so you could have tiered testing and screening perhaps maybe. I mean, I think in Europe they're suggesting if you meet certain sort of tests and screens initially, you get registration and you can streamline and move in. If there are some questions along the way, you move to the kind of next level of testing and from there. But 
yeah, you're right. I mean, we do have different regimes depending on the type of harm, but carcinogens have sort of dominated the discussion of risk assessment for a long time in this area. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening with non-carcinogenic effects as well. Sure. Uh, Bill, you, you mentioned, I think, on the pesticides that the test was uh, whether there was a reasonable certainty of no harm. Well, that's the new Food Quality Protection Act standard for dealing with the Delaney prohibition for carcinogens, but the general standard is still sort of unreasonable risk for pesticides, right? But reasonable certainty of no harm was the congressional response to a couple of circuit court decisions that basically shut down FDA and EPA when they tried to find a way around and create a de minimis risk ex exception to the Delaney prohibition, and the court said, sorry, we can read the statute pretty well here, you can't do that. And so Congress actually stepped in and passed some new legislation and created this new standard. And it's a reasonable certainty of no harm as yeah. opposed to uh, a 100% certainty that the harm will be very slight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way. And it's a broad standard. Uh, others yeah. jump in whenever. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you know, this is a classic problem is do you have to prove that it's safe or prove that it's not risky? I mean, or, you know, deadly. And, you know, and that's the very different techniques that, to, that can be applied to, to explore those two options. And um, um, and then the question is who has to do the proof? Um, and so this this you know this is not you know sort of been determined and it's always going to go in a certain way. It's very much up for discussion in the in the legal system, and it's it's hard. I mean, then the European U.S. differences. Suppose that they come up with different chemicals that have different different uh, you know you know permission. Uh, you know, how do you handle that, and which standard do you fall back on? And it, it gets to be very, very complicated. You had, a, you had a statement there which reminded me of Spectrum, which was, I think it was uh, a not unreasonable harm. Or what, what were the two standards again? Well, the main standard is unreasonable risk. But this, so unreasonable yeah. risk. That's, yeah. that's, in some sense, exactly what Spectrum is, yeah. which, and you probably know the exact term. There's, like, not unreasonable interference or... Or, or harmful interference. Harmful, yeah. What's harmful interference or unreasonable yeah. risk? These are... Not only do you have the burden, but you also have a vague standard. Yes, and so in, in environmental law, we have significant risk, acceptable risk, unreasonable risk, de minimis risk. They're all kind of saying the same thing, but they get defined in different ways, you know, depending on the problem. But there, there, there's out. not a specific definition that these things What would like. you say? Is there a standard that we've sort of coalesced around? I mean, I, I, I would, I, no, I, I think it varies from, you know, air to water to, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, what, what environmental risk are you talking about? And, you know, you look at the court case now, I mean, things get, you know, well, the, the mercury standard, you know, from pollution from power plants just got thrown out. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, do you set the level here or here or here? And each one has a certain risk reduction and each one has a certain cost. And the risk reduction and the costs are both uncertain. And this is the question came up at lunch is, you know, how do you do that? Well, you, you can do that. I mean, you look at the risks of the costs and the benefits. But you have to, you know, do you draw a hard right line whether it's acceptable or not? And the answer is no. It's hard. I mean, Bill, you said one assessment of one chemical lasted 28 years? Formaldehyde, oh, I'm sorry, TCE took 28 years. Formaldehyde still going on a couple decades in. Dioxin still going on 23 years in. You just yeah. continued research So this is one analysis. issue, right? There's all kinds of problems here in opening this up and bringing in lots of other. I, I was going to say, if, yeah. if, if part of what we're trying to decide here is whether it makes sense that the FCC should move in the direction of risk <laughs> assessment, one of the risks you would have to assess yeah. is whether the FCC would ever get there if we wanted to go in that direction. Well, I mean, right? this is the <laughs> institutional design question is do you want to create a system that has checks in it so that you don't end up with a multi-decade risk assessment? It seems to me it would be impossible in Spectrum, but again, I thought Spectrum was a vitamin before I walked in here, so I don't really know. <laughs> but I do think, you know, the question is can you control this from becoming an increasingly elaborate formal enterprise that goes on and on? And with, with EPA, you've got a whole peer review process that is kicked in around this, and so there's a science advisory board, there's the National Research Council, and they're very involved in an iterative process with EPA. And so things are getting kip, kicked back all the time, and it takes literally decades. But at the end of the day, like with dioxin, my understanding is they've got sort of three extrapolation models that all seem to fit the evidence that they have reasonably well, but they end up with risk estimates that vary by three to four orders of magnitude, and nobody can agree. So now what do you do? What's your decision rule at that point? And so this is an argument for sometimes the simpler approach, even if it's overprotective, 
may have some virtues because it gets you to a decision faster than one that's very elaborate and creates opportunities for rent-seeking behavior and various other types of shenanigans, but also the analytical burden is just being quite extreme here. We need a lot more retrospective analysis, too, of these stories and what has worked and what hasn't worked, right? And I think more learning in that sense about what, you know, what's effective and how to, how to design them. So, Francisco, I, I, from, from reading your bio, I get the sense you, you're sort of in there working with companies, whether they're regulated or, or not, on any kind of risk that they may focus on. Is there, are there like some good case studies you can share with us to tell us what works? I can tell you, I wish I had a client that would hire me for 28 years. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's money to be made in yeah. this, by the way. There is, yeah. there is money to be made. I think I would like to contrast a bit with that experience. I think it's important that we, we take into account EPA was at the forefront of this. And the reason, I guess, part of these problems that Bill is describing very well come from this long history of doing risk assessment. Uh, with the work, I guess I would like to talk a little bit about the private sector and also the public sector. So I will jump in the public just to contrast a bit with the EPA experiences we have in share. Uh, we're lucky to work quite a bit, or we have worked quite a bit with different food safety agencies here, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Specifically in the U.S., you have the FDA. I guess, can I use that acronym? <laughs> and FSIS, which is a branch of the Department of Agriculture that deals with food safety issues that come from animal stuff, right? So every time you see on TV there is an outbreak of salmonella, E. coli, et cetera, et cetera, that is part FSIS, part FDA. Uh, FSIS has been very, very keen in changing this EPA type of paradigm. So what they do is that they strongly believe in fit for purpose kind, kind of risk assessment. There is no A to Z process to do a risk assessment. Instead, is what is the risk management question? and what is the data that we need or we currently have to answer this question. So I can tell you an FSIS risk assessment may take as short as maybe six months. Some of them may drag to four or five years. I never heard of one for 20 years, but you can actually go to the website and see the type of work, type of work they have done. The interesting part of that kind of work in microbial food safety specifically, that is bugs that make you sick, is that uh, the analysis always had to do with certain quantification of the effect of a change of policy. So for example, if uh, the government decides to change the way uh, poultry plants will test for certain bugs, right? and so you need to increase the sample by this much, you can't just say you need to increase it. FSIS or FDA will have to say, well, you actually have to increase it by this much because the cost to society will be a net benefit. So the risk assessment part is to quantify how much benefit there will be Typically, it's reduction of illnesses, deaths, et cetera. And then we hand that, hand that over to people like Greg, who are actually work in a cost-benefit analysis, <coughs> to do a societal risk analysis. In other words, to see what is the balance, which is kind of what Paul was referring to as well, to just try to weigh the risk and the benefit. <coughs> so I guess I don't want to say that <laughs> uh, risk assessment is without flaws, but there are several examples in the government today here in the U.S. where it works and it continues to be used. Now, in the private sector, which is, I guess, uh, uh, where I can share a bit more experience with, with this group, uh, risk assessments are done, done all the time, and sometimes they're not full risk assessment for risk analysis. And I think the main difference that we see in the private sector is that we don't always talk about harm, right? Here we're always talking about cancer, uh, um, chronic diseases, you know, I got some really bad salmonellosis. We don't want to describe exactly what happens with salmonella, but you know. <laughs> so uh, in, in the private sector, a lot of times the work we do has to do, of course, with money. So for example, in pharmaceuticals, which has to do with these health things we were talking about, uh, when they develop drugs, depending on the size of a company, may have a couple hundred different drugs in what they call the pipeline. That is, we came up with a product. It seems to work in vitro, so in cell studies, maybe in a few mice. Shall we go ahead and go for the second phase, which may cost me <coughs> several billion dollars to get to the, the third phase and so on? So those are kind of things where the methodology that is kind of similar, quite similar actually to this health methodology, is also used. So we measure both harm, which would be how much money will I lose if I go ahead with this drug and you know FDA doesn't approve it, but also opportunities. So how much money could I make if it gets approved? So in these d different disciplines, even within your own, you said there can be a great range in how long it takes to do these assessments and up to 28 years or more. Um, is that just, uh, uh, I can imagine there's a lot of analytical 
chemical engineering, whatever research that goes into it. Uh, but I'm guessing there's some outside sort of institutional forces that play games with that. Is that? Yeah, and so I mean, this goes back to the burden. Think about the incentives. If you're a manufacturer, you want to sell formaldehyde. If you have the burden of producing the risk assessment, you want to get that through the process as quickly as you can. If EPA is doing the risk assessment, you're going to fight that for a long time as long as you can keep selling your chemical. And because formaldehyde was grandfathered in as one of these existing chemicals and essentially presumed safe, right, they fight and fight and fight. So that's not the only thing that's going on, but I think that's certainly part of it. And I think, again, I totally agree that there are lots of really important and interesting and effective uses of risk assessment happening every day across the federal government and including EPA uh, and many other agencies involved in health, safety, and environmental law. But there is something deeply problematic about some of these risk assessments. And the National Research Council has done multiple evaluations of this. Here's the latest from 2009, Science and Decisions. And their conclusion is the regulatory risk assessment process is bogged down, facing you know, substantial challenges to its ability and its ability to deliver useful, credible knowledge to regulators. Uncertainty continues to lead to multiple interpretations and contributes to decision-making gridlock. And so we haven't gotten to the next level of how to actually put a decision framework around the uncertainty that we have. And this is where I think folks from engineering are way ahead of the folks in the environmental area in some ways. I want to just throw another dimension onto this, which is uh, the public uh, and people's perceptions of risks very dramatically. Um, uh, EPA did a big study where they went out and they said, okay, here are all the things that we sort of have control over. You know, when we had the public sort of rank, what, what are they worried about? And then they had the scientists at the EPA rank what they're worried about. And the, the mismatch was quite significant. And so this led to a whole multi-year, many millions of dollars, sort of risk ranking exercises, trying to use the technique, using a technique to be able to figure out where the, why the disconnect happens. Um, and um, it, it, it was not very successful. Because uh, once again, they didn't, they didn't make it into a sort of a rigorous experiment where they could learn something. They basically let any, any sort of uh, county or city or state or region go through and sort of hodgepodge various things to rank. And they, were, they, they really could not sort of extract information about how to do this. Because, you know, it'd be really interesting if you could go through, and we tried. I mean, we, we actually had the, at Carnegie Mellon, we, we, we went through and tried to do the systematic approach. Because then if a new risk pops up, you don't have to go and reassess everything. You look at the characteristics, and you can put it in the right location without having to go and do a huge new study again. And that was the goal, and, and, and we, we did lots and lots and lots of papers on it. But it has gotten very quiet. And I think it's I think it's I think it's another another factor when it comes to whether these things take time or not. The the you talk about the public perception, you know, when you were talking about the nuclear zone, I think you said there's a sort of a presumed ten mile zone. Right. Uh, and that that's probably uh, appropriate in some cases, maybe too conservative in some cases or too right, because it's because and I presume that's because of variables at the site that make one site more or yeah. less vulnerable yeah. to different types of so, well, here's a question. What happened to property values within 10 miles of nukes after Fukushima? Uh -huh. Yeah? yeah. It, it, they didn't change. Uh -huh. this, you, know, we've done, you know, we've done probably 20 plants now. Um, and which would you li rather live next to, a nuke or a coal plant? Nukes all day long. Yeah, nukes, man. You can find million-dollar properties within a couple of miles of a nuke because they tend to be near the water, and you, each front <laughs> property is worth something. No, it's really, I mean, it's quite amazing. But it also strikes me if you if you got more granular and you started looking more specifically at real risks, uh, and uh, this nuke gets a four mile circle and that nuke sticks with a ten, and I'm living at one and my friends live at the other, and I'm like, wait, what? How come? How come you just shrunk my zone? Or right? Yeah, I mean that's the question: is do, do you update the zones every year after some improvement in the safety or some mistake that happened, and then you have to recalibrate what the risks are? And does the zone keep changing? Which is, with the 10 mile fixed, doesn't change. And, it, and it's very easy, and people were very happy with that. But now it's gonna be a much different process. You talk about the, the public perception. I think that's really important. I like, you know, I, I always tell my students, I'm this cold calculating economist, and we have engineering. We're, we're here trying to tell you how great quantitative risk assessment is. But the values in terms of principles, not values in terms of dollar values, really matter 
in a lot of these things. Uh, you know, economists would say, well, why can't we sell kidneys? You know, and there's, there's a prohibition on the market that this is not a, not a thing that we want as a society. We currently don't want people to sell their kidneys. It might be a way of doing things that make a lot of people a lot better off. We also have, uh, it, you know, we're, we're getting to the, you know, the point where we are getting, hopefully getting closer and closer to self-driving cars. Well, these self-driving cars have a, probably, I, I'm going to venture, a much lower probability of accident. But, you know, they're going to have to be programmed to make some value decisions as to what if there's an unavoidable accident? Do you run into the guy on the left or the right, or do you protect the occupant? How do you figure out what to do? And these are not things that necessarily just come out of the calculation of the, the present discounted value of, of somebody's life, and you don't know whether this person is a genius that you're going to hit, and that person is, not going to, is compassionate, and how do you compare across these people? All these things matter in in terms of what you might do, in terms of how, how things come about. But as I said, I want to I wanna at least get us to the point where we can make those decisions, isolating those things, rather than saying, we should just get rid of self-driving cars because they're going to cause an accident once in a while. You know, we, shouldn't allow, we shouldn't allow the incumbent of the driver car to, it's the status quo. The other one's going to have some problems at some points in time. And we don't want to do that. But public perception is going to be a big part of this. It, it feels like, um, uh, in theory, the benefits of a risk assessment, when I think about the FCC and Spectrum in particular, the benefits of, of, of risk assessment versus a uh, sort of bright line, worst case scenario, seem pretty obvious. It's the implementation challenges that, that we have. Um, and in these other industries and agencies and regulators who have, who have adopted it, has it been has it been sort of a bright line? There came a moment where EPA said we're doing it, and there was a there was a debate about that, and they said now we're doing it, and there are other agencies who just haven't caught up, or is it not as binary as that? So for FDA and EPA, um, my view on the history here is that you had good civil servants trying to find a way forward in the face of uh, very challenging uh, and protective standards. And so at FDA, um, we had the Delaney Clause, but there was, because of the livestock industry, a sort of a provision called the DES proviso that was uh, enacted in 1962, I believe, that said if you're using uh, carcinogenic substances as supplements in animal, f animal feed, um, you can still sell the food even if, as long as you can show there's no residue of those substances, okay? And so that's 1962. And, um, during that period, there's a revolution, literally a revolution in analytical techniques and detection capabilities going on. So from the 60s to the 70s, our ability to detect very low levels of substances in various different media improved by multiple orders of magnitude. Well, suddenly, DES, which was below detection limits in 1962, starts showing up all over the place. Uh, and yet then, and so then FDA is like, well, we have to actually, do we have to ban this? Uh, if we have to ban this, you know, because of the Delaney Clause, how are we going to find our way forward? They develop a quantitative risk assessment to try to deal with this and understand this and create this idea of de minimis risk. And so FDA sort of falls into this, I think, in, in trying to find a way out of Delaney. With EPA, same time, this is the early 1970s, again, good civil servants trying to figure out a way to regulate vinyl chloride under a very health protective portion of the Clean Act, Section 112, it said you have to regulate these hazardous air pollutants uh, at a level that will protect public health with an ample margin of safety. And these carcinogenic uh, compounds at the time, and I think still many people believe, there's no threshold. There's no safe level of exposure. And so EPA starts to develop uh, a quantitative risk assessment for vinyl chloride to also try to create this idea of de minimis risk and, or what would be acceptable risk. And that gets caught up in this long saga, and it finally works its way through the courts, and then ultimately Congress comes in and, and revises that portion of the statute. But that's where it started. And then it gets it picks up speed in a big way with a 1980 decision by the Supreme Court, which was an OSHA case, where OSHA had tried to develop a generic cancer policy, where they said, look, we OSHA have an impossible task of trying to regulate carcinogens in the workplace, because there's dozens, hundreds of them, potentially, <laughs> right? And if we go chemical by chemical, it'll take forever, and workers are going to die. So we're going to set up a generic cancer policy that looks a lot like Delaney that says if it causes cancer in animals, if there's evidence that it causes cancer in animals, we will regulate to the lowest permissible, feasible level. And the Supreme Court comes in and says, no, no, 
sorry, you need to sh demonstrate that there's actually a significant risk before you go forward and regulate. You essentially create a new threshold requirement. Uh, and that really sets things in motion uh, across various different agencies for quantitative risk assessment. And then you have various NRC reports in 1983 and lots of other things happening. The Society for Risk Analysis is created in 1980, a whole kind of professional group of folks. And so I'd say by the early 80s, it's really up and running uh, in some ways. But there was a moment in the early 70s when where it, where it could have gone either way. I think everything was kind of pushing by the late 70s toward this embrace of quantitative risk assessment because people needed techniques to try to make decisions at the end of the day. And I think nobody thought you'd end up in a situation where it took years and years and years to get to some results. Uh, so that's my take on the history of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the national... The parallel story, I guess, of reactor safety, too. Yeah, and, and, and uh, that was, you know, really driven. I mean, uh, if you look at what happened after Three Mile Island, I mean, there was a really good motivating event to get people thinking hard about this. Um, uh, and uh, but if you look at the National Academy, I mean the, the documents that come out of the National Academies uh, on you know how to do these studies and how important they are and why to do them, and they must come out every two or three years with another one. Yeah. I mean it, it is truly it's and once again if you want to be on a committee, I'm supposed to be on a committee now in, in D.C. I might huh. here instead. You're better off here. Well, I was yeah. it was offshore oil platforms yeah. and so <laughs> yeah. it was something else. But uh, oil's cheap right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So as, as, uh, as this kind of risk assessment approach um, becomes seemingly more relevant in different areas, is there like a, a, um, a, a, a path that the participants and the stakeholders in sort of the ecosystem have to live through that, you know, of, of you know, like the stages of, of uh, grief uh -huh. and all that? I mean, is there a, uh, because I, I, you know, I think we've all seen, uh, uh, you know, change. There's a, there are a lot of people that any kind of change just scares, it makes people nervous, they're averse to. Uh, if, if part of the discussion here is, you know, is this something that the FCC should be pushed towards doing, what, what could we expect from, you know, whether it's folks in the mobile broadband space or the cable space or the satellite space or wherever? So I have a question. Who, who, who has the burden right now to do the worst case analysis? Uh, who, so the interferer is coming into the spectrum, and did they have the burden to, to do the worst case analysis, or is the regulator doing that? Or is it unclear? It, yeah, so usually what happens. Looking at me, I don't know. Looking at Pierre. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. The, 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 yeah, yeah, he, he has the burden. <laughs> Actually, Actually, I was going to argue that it's, the, it's a good thing of what we have to do is move the burden from the lawyers to the engineers, yeah, yeah. right? That the, the, will never happen. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but that's that's the that's the part that you know. Yeah, because because what, what the people who do it in, in your fields as well yeah. are you know the scientists and the engineers who are doing things. I think that's the same thing. The lawyers are the ones who make it last twenty eight years. Well, maybe I can share a couple of things in the private sector. The way it has traditionally worked for us, and I think uh, it's something that will well apply to someone new to this: is start small. Uh, if you were to start with a grandiose plan of adopting very rigorous risk assessment methods, you may end up planning for 10 years without getting anything done. So perhaps baby steps is a way to just get started and, and improve. Now, the other thing we have, we have seen and we have experience working with, there are outside of the U.S., there are good examples. And we know the, the European Union is a fairly new yeah, can call it organization as, as long as it lasts for the next five years or so. But they have uh, the European Food, the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, and they started just 10 years ago, 11, 11, 10 years ago, and they wanted to start from the get-go with very rigorous quantitative risk assessment methods to evaluate uh, food safety hazards. Right? Their mistake, is, and this is acknowledged by them, is that they try to separate too much what. I guess what we're using here is engineers, or what the scientists were doing, versus what the decision makers were doing. And that, in that case, is the European Commission. Right? Uh, the, the appeal of that was to say, let's let the science speak, and we will make the decisions based on completely unbiased scientific opinions. But yet, the problem that that started was that there was zero communication between the risk manager, which is what we call the person making the decision, and the risk analyst. And what happens with these things is that there is an interaction. When you start doing a risk analysis, you will find there are 50 new questions. And how do you convey those questions back to the decision makers so then they can 
reiterate what they actually want to do. So I, I, will, I will say my two recommendations as a practitioner, as I said, would be start small. And second of all, don't separate too, too much the analysis from the decision because although it's appealing to think that independence, scientific independence is good, you're going to end up, as EFSA did, giving the wrong answer. Yeah, the public perception, uh, and, and, and it's changed a lot. In the old days, before we had the internet, you know, rumors and gossip and, you know, uh, were a little harder to spread. But now it is amazing how fast things can happen. When you start to interfere with somebody's signal at their house, uh, and they're going to start a blog, and then they're going to start a website, and then they're going to, you know, start to petition congressmen and so on. And it could be, you can lose control very, very quickly. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's the response and the ability now with this communication to, to talk about concerns. And if you are in an ivory tower or in a, you know, a, you know, an engineering firm and you're not, you know, relating with the public, it is almost a sure sign that something's going to go wrong and you're going to lose control over the process. So you got to bring in, and you got to do it from the beginning. You can't sort of, you know, do all the work and then say, okay, now we're going to, now we're going to sell it because the, the solution that you come up with has to have that integrated in. So Bill, to, to kind of get back to your question, to the extent it's helpful, I guess the way to describe it, and Julie, you can correct me here, but uh, you know, when when the commission is changing the rules, basically, or uh, new services coming in, or or they're moving uh, systems or services between bands. Uh, they do a rulemaking process, and everybody who's got an interest just comes in and submits their mm. analytical research, and, and Julie and the other smart folks at the FCC, in their Solomonic ways, uh, say, all right, here are, the, here are the limits of your ability to operate devices in these, in these bands. Um, now, you, you know, there's, there's one example in the FCC, uh, which is kind of interesting, and I don't know quite what it means, here, so I'll just throw it out there, which is unlicensed spectrum. So typically, a license means uh, you have the right to use a certain band of spectrum within certain operating power, but you have the exclusive right in that geographic area. Unlicensed says, uh, as long as you keep your device at this limited power level, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and it's just a free-for-all, so to speak. Uh, and, and the big success story in that area has been Wi-Fi, where the commission just says, you know, in these bands, you can run these devices, Keep it below this power level. Sky's the limit, but uh, you, you can't cause interference to other folks who we, we have licensed, and you have to accept any interference. So it's sort of the it's the it's the you accept 100% risk of total meltdown uh, potentially, um, uh, but but we're not going to other than that you know we're not going to touch you. And Wi-Fi has mushroomed uh, in that space. There's an ongoing debate now that's beyond the scope of this, cat, uh, this panel as to uh, 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 new technologies wanting to move in there. Uh, but I don't know, are there, are there other examples in these other industries of where regulators have taken that other approach and sort of said, well, essentially, it's a, it really is a free market? Well, there, there's certainly, you know, uh, you know EPA, it, it, with a couple of these more recent uh, uh, regulations that have come out, dealing with water and dealing with air, is they're greatly trying to expand what they control and what gets brought under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, especially the, you know, the water ruling is now on hold because uh, they were trying to say, well, you know, the original Clean Water Act dealt with navigable waters, mm -hmm. and now we're dealing with anything that can end up in navigable waters is now under their purview. And the courts have to decide whether or not that's a, you know, is that a good expansion or not. Um, and so, you know, you know, the in the olden days, you know, you could build a pond on your land. Well, maybe you can't anymore because of the, the, the potential interpretation of the new EPA regs. Uh, Pierre, am I, are we supposed to open it up here? Can we yeah. do that? Yeah. So please, folks. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Jeff Ward Bailey, uh, and uh, I am Pierre's research assistant. 
and uh, <laughs> uh, student over at the College of Engineering. Um, and I'm just curious, question for um, any of the panelists. In a, in a general way, um, does the, the math behind uh, computing these quantitative risk assessments, so Monte Carlo simulations and that kind of thing, does that get any, has that gotten any easier over the past couple of decades with um, increases in computing power? Um, or does it, is it the kind of thing where no matter how much processing you throw at it, you still need uh, expertise to, to actually make the analysis? It's a softball. Who wants it? I mean, come on. <laughs> you first. You go ahead. Yeah, it, 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 so, I mean, uh, there is no question uh, that uh, the, the add-ons to Excel allow anyone to do Monte Carlo. Uh, sim, you know, simulations of almost whatever they want. Uh, th there are several. There's one called At Risk that is now sold millions of copies. And you can do, you know, pretty sophisticated analysis. Now, whether those analysis, analyses re reveal anything useful or correct is another completely different topic. Uh, the, you know, I think that the, the ease of use has greatly exceeded the knowledge of the users, is what I would say. I, I think that's a really important point, and I think the more contemporary history of risk assessment at EPA as its statutory responsibilities expanded into new domains like Superfund sites and various other areas, um, they were almost forced to take advantage of computational models across various domains and, of course, the increased computational capacity and using models in fate and transport and exposure in various different areas. And so there are literally 100 plus models in use across various domains in EPA. And the NRC, again, has looked at this and said, you're not systematically evaluating those models, right? There are too many models to actually evaluate in some cases. Uh, and so we don't ultimately know how well, you know, those models are doing in terms of giving us concrete, you know, a, conc a sense of the sort of concrete realities on the ground in terms of what we're trying to regulate. But the EPA has no other choice here, right? They simply can't go out and measure everything at a Superfund site. And so I, I totally agree that our capabilities in terms of simulations, et cetera, have um, perhaps exceeded our understanding in places, and we've moved beyond experience in a lot of this, right? We're not doing kind of the actuarial risk assessment that was sort of common a long, long time ago. Uh, this is a different kind of set of knowledge, practices, and claims that, that we can now make. So, so one of the things I said was, I, I agree with everything they said, you know, we're going to do a lot better job of using the inputs we have. One of the things we need to do is to focus on trying to get better inputs and better judgment, there's a lot of judgment that goes into these things. Those are harder to you know, have computing power. Although, you know, as I talked about, the value of a statistical life that you're going to put into a, a uh, drug approval or, or cleanups and other things, you look at the implied value of statistical life across government policies, and it's huge the way we get it. So obviously, we're still, we still have a lot of progress to go in terms of using this computing power to get to a more coherent and consistent policy implications of what we can do with QRA. It's just to add on top of all that has been said already, yes, computers are faster, better, and we have many more, many more algorithms and methods to work with. But I would dare say that now it's harder to do a proper risk assessment than it was 20 years ago, because 20 years ago we were talking about chemical risk assessments. We had three dose response models, uh, two tools to use, and a much more prescriptive way of doing things because of that limitation. Now we have complete new statistical methods. I'm, I guess many of you may be familiarized with Bayesian analysis. So the, the tools are easier to use. The options are way more. And the other issue that we're talking about is validation. Model validation is very important. And that's something that some agencies do fairly well within them by peer reviews, uh, by uh, uh, other types of validation, but at the end of the day, validating the model is very, very tough because the essence of risk analysis is to predict something that is yet to happen. And if you don't observe it, there is no 100% sure way of validating. I will just say the courts have been complicit in this too. I mean, they've allowed uh, a lot of this to go forward because they simply can't evaluate you know, what these, these techniques are really telling the agency. So the federal courts, again, uh, have been very deferential uh, not always, but very differential. Yeah, my, I have a, cla a freshman class that's evaluating 50 different carbon footprint <laughs> calculators, uh, <laughs> side by side by side by side, and just to see how different they really are. 
And these are all out on the web, and people are using them. And, but, you know, what the hell are they worth? We don't know yet. <laughs> um, a, a broad question for the, the panel here is, uh, what, how would you assess the ability to apply your quantitative analysis to climate change? Now, that's not a softball. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of the all the problems that we've talked about are there in space, um, and so you know, how do you verify climate models? Right, and there are these big models out there, and uh, and you know, how do you you know when do you when do you start questioning the models because you know the actual readings are diverging or not? I mean, there is tremendous amount of discussion about this. Um, and the, the other thing that's, that's rampant in, in, is the advocacy groups have gotten quite vocal. Uh, and when, when things don't go the way that you want, then you up the ante by increasing the volume uh, of, your, of your response. And that has muddied the water so tremendously that it's very hard to you know, get down to, the, you know, to, to what's really important. I mean, I think there is, there's, there's been a sort of uh, overemphasis maybe on climate models to some extent and their abilities to make medium-term predictions over kind of regional geographic scales, but those ultimately are the ones we care about. Um, I think there's an interesting kind of set of questions here around climate change and the kind of problem it is. If it's an irreversible problem with potentially catastrophic consequences, then it might be the kind of problem that should be. Um, amenable to worst case precautionary types of decision making. Um, but we're so far behind, in my view, in terms of where we need to be and what we need to be doing that, you know, we're, we're starting down that road and our risk assessment is probably gonna, not going to have a huge impact on um, our decisions about how fast to decarbonize. It seems to me a cost benefit analysis, you know, to some extent will, and your choices of discounting rates and all of that are going to be important. But it is a, a, a very different kind of problem that really pushes on our conceptions of space and time in fundamental ways. And climate models are very important heuristics in terms of helping us with our understanding of the climate system, which we know a lot about, right? And the physics of this is pretty rock solid. But in terms of giving us real sort of insight into what's going to happen in Colorado in 2030 or 2040 or 2050, they're never going to go. Yeah, I, I know we're supposed to favor students, and I see one of my fellow sophomores has a question. <laughs> Sophomore, I think, would be the same. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Richard Bennett. Um, so risk assessment, I, it, it, just, it strikes me there are different ways to do quantitative risk assessment. And I think in the real world, we often consider risk in relation to reward. And, and it kind of sounds like that EPA model with all these different acceptables and reasonable risks and all that, it, it, does it, it, that it might capture that? I mean, I'm aware that certainly the way that IARC does carcinogen, carcinogenicity studies doesn't really relate to anything except the probability of being right. So is there a difference between the way, say, EPA assesses carcinogenicity and the way IARC does it? Um, I don't have the knowledge or the ability to be able to comment on whether or not there's a huge difference between the way they're approaching carcinogen risk, risk assessment. I do think the concept or notion of risk and acceptable risk does have this volitional quality to it that you're suggesting. And if you look at the history of this, EPA used to think about its mandate in terms of safety and endangerment and hazard and moved over time to thinking about things more in the context of risk pushed by the federal courts. And that does bring in that sort of nothing ventured, nothing gained, volitional context to some extent, but in terms of how that filters down to the methodology specifically, um, I think there are kind of standard approaches uh, to this, but Paul probably knows more than I Well, I, yeah, once again, I, 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 I know of the models. I don't know of, well, I probably, if I thought hard about it, I could remember something, but uh, uh, I, mean, that's the, I mean, that's one of the problems that, that is that you, the question is, where are their differences? Is it in the input data that they're, that they're using? Uh, is it in the, uh, is it in the valuation of the output? Is it in the models that are inherent inside? And then, you know, are the, and how do the models differ? And then, you know, they're, they're, there was a, a big climate, IPCC4, the, the big inter, inter, uh, intergovernmental panel that went, looked at climate change. 
they, uh, you know, they, they did these big, they separate around the world, and I took these big five models that took months to run, and they all show up in Switzerland, and they're going to show their results, and the difference between them will give an idea about the uncertainty. I thought that would be a great measure of that. And they go and they put them all up on the screen, and they're right on top of each other. And they go, this isn't right. I mean, we've got a problem here. It's great they're all, you know, it doesn't mean that we know exactly what's going on. It's, you know, it, it means that we all had the same underlying assumptions, and so the models aren't telling us anything about the uncertainty. And, and so what did they do? They went out to a bar and got a napkin and drew what they <laughs> thought the uncertainty was. But that's an aside. But, but, but it, it, it really is that, I mean, just because you have agreement amongst models does not mean they could be coming from very, very different places, and they happen to end up in the same place for reasons that are not supportive of the, the fact that they're in agreement. So I think that um, it sounds very much like this panel could go on for another half an hour, and a lot of us wish that it would. Um, <laughs> however, the breaks are the most important part of these events. Uh, it's time uh -huh. for a break. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel and be back at quarter to uh, the hour. Yeah, yeah, I just actually reconnected. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a class. Yeah, I get paid to do this. You know. Energy resources. <laughs>